You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Thank you for joining us and sticking with the podcast. If you're here for Theo Rossi, uh, it's a great interview. I'm really excited about it. If you like it, all I ask is you subscribe, maybe write a review, follow us on our handles, but uh, subscribe and listen to the podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Ryan, good to see you. Good to see you too. Yep, you had a great weekend. You saw a friend. You needed it. You needed I did. a little Ryan time. In the middle of Ryan time, went to Washington, D.C., saw a friend of mine who lives out there and had a great little weekend. I saw like the Red that. Hot Chili Peppers, which I was not. How were they? Awesome. Was Flea naked? Uh, Flea, no. He was shirtless and wearing a kilt, and he did a handstand uh, when he came out for the encore. He walked out on his hands. The guy's uh, turning 60 this year. The underwear underneath? Yeah. Were they all ripped up? With the underwear? No, the, their frames. Their, their frames? Yeah, they're all in great shape. All the arms were showing. Really? Yeah. They're all turning. Anthony Kiedis, nice chest. Nice chest. Great. Yeah, great, uh, great body. But he came out in like a mess shirt, and uh, we we took <laughs> a bet. We took a bit like how how many songs before it's off. I said three songs tops. It was gone by the yeah three songs exactly. <laughs> three songs. Boom. Three songs. Boom. This is when I take my shirt off. It's done. I recommend it. They're they're torn around. All right. I was never a, a massive like a, like a like a super fan, but uh, great show, great rock show. I like that. Yeah. I hope you guys are doing well this week. Um, thanks again for watching, listening. Uh, you can listen anywhere, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube. You can watch. Make sure you write a review. Our handles are, Ryan. Uh, at Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. That's exactly right. Uh, check out the Inside of You online store. We've got great stuff. Uh, Smallville, a Lexmas script signed by me. We've got um, Funko Pop Lex Luthor sign. We've got Inside of You merch, hats, and mugs and tumblers and all that stuff so the inside of you online store also a reminder if you haven't check out the new podcast talkville tom and i tom welling we talk about we watch every episode of smallville from the beginning and we review it so that's airs every wednesday you can watch on youtube or listen wherever you get your podcasts and uh ryan we have a lot of fun doing that as well we do i'm we learning do. a lot huh i'm learning a lot about your past <laughs> you are learning a lot i'm learning a lot about my past yeah um Man, well, let's just do it. I think we can get right into it. Oh, mm -hmm. Also, just a quick reminder to join Patreon if you want to support the podcast. We need you. We love you. Top tier patrons get shout outs and boxes of merch sent to them every couple months. There's different tiers. Anything you want to uh, help support the podcast, it really helps. I'll send you a message after patreon.com slash inside of you. And without further ado, let's get inside. Well, you know him from Sons of Anarchy, but he's done a ton of stuff. He's got a new movie coming out. We talk about that, but we really talk about mental health. And boy, he opens up. I love this interview. I remember it distinctively. Distinctly? Mm -hmm. Either? Either. <laughs> let's get inside of Theo Rossi. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You. Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Dude, you're doing all these interviews. You're all popular and shit. So silly. And the fact that I'm like third on your Sons of Anarchy list is even more funny. <laughs> third? What do you mean? I know you had Flanagan, Coates. I know you had these people on. Well, I, I know, know those Paul. guys. I know those guys. It's irrelevant. It's <laughs> irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. I've already <laughs> talked to Hunnam. He's banning your show. He's already said it's not happening. That's it. He's done. <laughs> That's hilarious. I like that you do the research on me. Yeah. I have to. I got to do the research. Man, the light in here is crazy. Uh, you look good, I though. I think you're a natural beauty. That's what I'll say. I, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a cover girl. Yes, I have the... Uh, the natural take me away Calgon look. I just <laughs> Dude, I remember the how old are you? How do you remember Calgon? Well, I remember everything. I'm an 80s, I'm an 80s freak. I watch in my downtime, like when I'm filming. This is like one of the weirdest things that I've started to do over the last couple of years. I just watch old commercials from like the 80s and 90s on four hour streams what's your favorite so, one what's your favorite commercial or, or one do you think one that you think of anything to do with toys r us is like so absolutely uplifting it's incredible <laughs> like when they're talking with jeffrey the giraffe <laughs> just having so much fun um max hedrum's commercials what was, were crazy. what was the toys r us theme song i don't want to grow up 
Um, a Toys R Us kid. There's a million Toys at Toys R Us that I can play yeah. with. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, how does that not uplift your spirits? It so, really does. Because I'm playing these like dark characters all the time and like they're always <laughs> in this horrific place. I try to balance it out by uh, watching commercials from the 80s and 90s. I like watching old uh, theme songs from the 80s. There was a show called Give Me a Break with Nell Carter. Give me a break. Yeah, I, I'm thinking a Kit Kat bar. But yes, I watched that show all the time. <laughs> you, you watched Give Me a Break? Of course. Do you remember? We're the probably around the same age. I'm 50. Oh, okay. So I'm three years younger. You, holy shit. Dude, yeah. you look really good or you have a filter on. I don't. This is it. It's. I swear to God, this is exactly the way I look. How do you I, look this yeah. young? I think I, I've asked this question a lot because, you know, I look at, I, I used to look at Ralph Macchio when I was younger and I'd be like, how does this guy look like, you know, young all the time? I, said that, yeah. then, I think now, now that I see my mom, cause I was raised by my mom and like, she always looked young. She's in her seventies now and she looks like 50. And then I think easy, I, I like, easy there. She looks 50. What are you saying? No, a hundred percent. My mom looks super young. Wow. So I think that it's because, and she's Middle Eastern, right? Right. And then my dad was like Spanish and Italian. And I think that somewhere along the line, the genetics have to do with it, like the Mediterranean thing or something. But also remember, I completely, like, I don't, I guess I'm not like actively trying to kill myself. Like a lot of people I know, <laughs> like, you know, drinking, right. smoking, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't I'm do not, any of that stuff? I don't do any of that. Yeah. Wow, you don't drink? Do you drink caffeine? I drink caffeine. Yeah, I, I do. I have two two coffees in the morning. That's it. I read expensive. that you were you've been a vegan, unless you've not. You're not a vegan anymore. I I started when I did True Story. I started eating eggs because I was doing only like 600, 700 calories a day. I was doing this weird thing, and I started eating eggs. But I I'm off that again. So I did eggs for a minute, but no, I don't eat anything like that maybe that's what it is maybe the fact that you don't eat meat you don't eat no you know? no no i you know what i no i don't think any of that i think that okay this sounds weird but i think that like to each his own right like what some people can do other people can't so you kind of can't like look at what other people do like i drink a ton of water but some people don't like to do that it doesn't mean that it's healthy it just means that it works for me, right? Like I happen to, when I'm not working, possibly partake in psilocybin a lot, right? But that's just my thing, right? What's it psilocybin? Mean, what's, what's I should know this. It's a uh, uh, mushroom. Shrooms. Yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you microdose or macrodose or what is it? You know, I kind of, I kind of, uh, I might, I might, I might allegedly might partake in a lot of it. Who knows? But the thing is, I, I, the maintaining of it, is the micro that you might call. And it's something that uh, I enjoy, but I think it makes me better, right? Like as in the way I, I exist in this whole thing, right? Not to get all metaphysical and weird, but it's like this whole shit is like a minute. So when I get back to the health aspect of it, it's like what works for me I don't think would work for someone else. Like I run every day, seven days a week. How, how far do you run? Between five and eight miles. At 47 years old, you're running this many miles. Seven days a week. I don't miss. Is it, a, is it an addiction? They say it takes 21 days to create a habit. Is it something that that, or is it just something you just, you just know now? I couldn't do it. It's like, I, oh, my camera just got buzzy. Hold on. Let me fix it. Now you look even better. Jesus. I know how to do it. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so here's my thought. I need it. So whether it's an addiction, however, they might put a label on the thing. I need it. It's the only time I'm alone. Crazy. I, it's not crazy. I, this is part of this podcast is to sort of dissect and like get to know someone and what works for them. You know, yeah. maybe someone out there is listening, going, you know, I'm going to try running five to seven. I don't know why you'd ever want to fucking run five to seven miles. It sounds <laughs> fucking awful. But My if day, it works for you. Yeah. It works for me. And here's why. I have two kids. I have an amazing wife. We live on a ranch in Austin. It's wow. incredible. We have a bunch of animals and do all the things. But I get that time early, early, early in the AM to kind of reset and contemplate and figure out 
all the things that because your time gets bastardized the second you get around a bunch of people, right? Like it just gets you things happen, right? That breaks or this happens or someone comes here or I have to talk to this person. So in that moment, whether it be five, six, seven, eight, whatever it is, the weekend I run longer, I know that I'm going to get 40, whatever, if I'm doing an 830 pace, whatever that is, eight times five or six, uh, like 46 minutes of pure peace for myself. If that makes perfect sense. It really does. It's like, you need that to check into your day, to get through the day. You need time for you. That's my meditation. That's my, that's my, so I figure out my roles when I'm doing that. I figure out my characters. I figure out how I'm going to like the things that I need to take on in the day. And, and I'm also an extremely, extremely routine person. That I've been for a long time. What do you like, do when I'll, you wake up? So besides, what's the first thing you do when you wake up? I could tell you the first thing I've been, I could tell you almost basically my entire day for the last, I guess if I'm thinking about time, almost like 13, 14 years, even when I'm working, I will do a version of it when I'm filming. So the second I get up, um, second I get up, I handle the dogs or, you know, whatever's going on, the kids are back to school. So I usually have to wake them up. And I do that by playing like a song really loud and turning on the lights. So it's like either I or the tiger or something that's just eighties, <laughs> eighties, yeah, eighties, something might be, uh, she's a little runaway by Bon Jovi. You never know. How something old are your kids? Five and seven. Two so boys. they're here and rising up <laughs> back on the street. Dad, turn that. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's me coming up and they usually are turning over one sleeps in a tent. He's been sleeping in a tent for a couple of months. I don't know why. I think I've been the sleeping. The other in sleeps in the bed in his room. So there's a full empty room. Um, and then, uh, I play Eye of the Tiger or today it was, uh, what did I play today? Something by journey. I think it might've been the one from stranger things. Um, so I was playing something, it gets them up. Then on a day like that, either my wife will take them and I'll pick them up because I'm home from filming. I just got back. So we'll split. Either I'll pick them up or she'll take them. And then point is I go right to run. Now flip that some days because I just got back. I'll go run at 530 in the morning or six so I can get back and then wake them up. Right. I'll try to do it before it. That's that's preferable to me. What time are you going to bed at night? 1030. I'm out. So you don't have so, that much sleep, six, six, seven hours. No, I try to get seven or eight. Yeah, six, seven. Yeah, 10.30, 10 o'clock. I'm all right. finished. All right. So you go for the run. Go for the run. Okay. Back, whatever happens with the kids, wherever we're at at that part of day. And then do you really want to go through all of it? Do you want to be how nuts? Do you want to see how nuts I am? I mean, kind of. Go, go. We'll do it. Okay. This is going to get weird. So then I, I fill up. I have like a half a gallon of water that I fill up. I put in uh, these... Uh, these minerals, trace minerals, and some uh, lemon. And then I fill up two other glasses that will be used later. One is with chlorophyll. One is with a little apple cider vinegar and water. It's mixed. And then uh, I get to work that I'm doing outside, whether it be like right now we're building a new chicken coop. Uh, we're building an enclosure for the donkeys. So I'll do something around here with uh, who's ever here with me. Right. And then I'll take the dog after now I'm back from the run. So me and Juno, who's right next to me sleeping, she's wild. Um, <laughs> she's like a hundred pound Shepsky. She's, she's always with me. She follows me everywhere. Nice. Shepherd Husky. Uh, we go on a giant walk around the property, like all around the ranch. And uh, we just check in on everything, seeing what's going on. Then sometime around noon, I'll eat something. Same breakfast every day. Complete insanity. What, I eat the same thing. I eat the same thing every day. What? Uh, it's uh, two pieces of Ezekiel toast with almond butter, one, <laughs> one, one apple, uh, a bunch of different berries, potentially some watermelon. When I was doing eggs, I was doing uh, uh, three eggs, right? And uh, that's it. Now a word from our sponsor, Better Help. Better Help. I don't know what we do without Better Help. 
Uh, you know, I have been lately dealing with a lot of anxiety and what happens is I hyper focus on all these negative things, Ryan, mm -hmm. that keep spiraling and I can't, I can't, I, it's hard to focus. It's, and it exhausts me and gives me anxiety and these thoughts kind of just, and I know it's not, I shouldn't be thinking all these things. And I, it's, it's like my mind, I can't put it to rest a lot of times. And, um, you know, it could be tough to, to train your brain to stay in problem solving mode and, you know, especially when you're facing challenges in life. And I know that therapy helps that talking to someone and having them talk to you objectively about what works, train professionals helps. It just does. I if, doing it on my own isn't working. It's just not working. If I don't have someone to talk to, I will just continue to spiral. There's no way out. That's how I feel. Do you feel that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you have to talk to somebody. You know, people always say, well, how'd you get into therapy? It's because I just couldn't solve these problems on my own. I couldn't, you know, it's, you could say you're going to do these things and you're saying, oh, you, you, what happens is you just bottle stuff up, folks. We just bottle things up until it becomes very toxic. And our body feels it physiologically. We feel the effects of, you know, pain, depression, anxiety, and it takes a toll on your mind and your body. And that is why I got into therapy. And I'll tell you, a lot of times I have nothing to talk about. And for the first five minutes, I'm like, why am I here? What am I doing? And by the end of it, I'm like, thank God I'm talking to somebody. My Lord. Look, if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. Ryan here does BetterHelp. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists any time. Um, you know, a lot of times people are selling things and there's ads you have to read. To me, this is the easiest read ever because it's just something I could talk about forever. And um, look, BetterHelp is is a great place. It's a it's a place to to help a lot of people. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash inside. Inside of you is brought to you by my good friends at Magic Spoon. How many of you have not tried Magic Spoon cereal? I don't know what to tell you other than Magic Spoon is the goods. Can I say it's the shit, man? <laughs> I'm going to. It's the shit. It's so good. I, I always talk about this, but, you know, when you're a kid, you drink, all, eat all these sugary cereals, and you don't worry about it because you're a kid. But when you get to be an adult, all these things become really bad for you, but not Magic Spoon. You can enjoy cereal now that doesn't have all the crap in it. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving, low-carb, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and only 140 calories a serving. You could build your own box with a huge variety of appealing flavors, cocoa, frosty, frosted, fruity, peanut butter, uh, blueberry, muffin, maple, waffle, honey nut, cookies and cream, cinnamon roll. It goes on and on. I mean, who doesn't love cereal? The crunch, Ryan. Mm. The sweetness, mm. the way you accidentally eat a whole box or sneak it as a midnight snack. Oh, yeah, that's what we do. Uh, Magic Spoon comes in. It's got you know, it has all those things that you miss. It's got that sweet, crunchy texture you love from childhood, but it's healthy. It's healthy. Magic Spoon has truly innovated and changed the game with sugary cereals. They spent time to perfect the crunchy texture and develop an outstanding, an astounding variety of flavors so that they always hit the spot, but without any of the things that are so bad for you. And it's packed with protein. And there's a flavor for everyone. Uh, you really need to try Magic Spoon. A lot of my friends have Magic Spoon. I love Magic Spoon. Here's what you do. You go to Magic Spoon dot com slash iou to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourselves and be sure to use our promo code iou at checkout to save five dollars off your order and magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a hundred percent happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason they'll refund your money no questions asked i don't know why why wouldn't you try something that no questions asked they'll give you your money back if you don't like it 
give it a shot. Right? Yeah. I I love that stuff. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this podcast. Inside of You is brought to you by Helix. Oh, there's nothing like a Helix sleep. I'll tell you, man, mattresses are everything for me. I've had a lot of spine surgeries. If I don't get a good night's sleep, if you don't get a good night's sleep, what are we? We're just, what, Ryan? Zombies. We're zombies. Yeah. Not having a good night's sleep. You know, people overlook it. They go, oh, I want a a decent car. I want to, you know, I want to spend money on this. But the the most important thing. Sleep. Sleep. You got to sleep on a good mattress. And Helix has the mattress for you. They take, you take a quiz. It's so quick and easy, but it tells them what's the right fit for you. And that's it. They have this quiz. Uh, it matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody's unique and Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. And even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size sleepers. That's right. I have a medium mattress. I'm like the porridge guy, I tell you. It's like I don't want anything too too soft or too hard, something right there in the middle so I could feel comfortable at night. But everybody's different. Some people like the hard sleep, the hard mattress. But again, you just take this little quiz. Trust me, it's Rosenbaum you're talking here. It's an easy quiz. It takes a minute or two of your time, and it tells you what mattress is perfect for you. It's been awesome getting message from you guys, messages about Helix and how happy you are with Helix. That makes me happy. Um, I really love this, uh, this place, this company. So look, if you're looking for a mattress, take the quiz, order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Oh, those are just miserable. You're like, they all kind of feel the same. I I don't know. I just, uh, Helix is awesome, but don't take our word for it. Helix was awarded the best, number one, best overall mattress pick of 2020, and by GQ and Wired Magazine. Just go to Helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep dot com slash inside take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life tell us about the warranty ryan they have a 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for a hundred nights risk free they'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it but you will helix is offering two hundred dollars off up to two hundred dollars off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helix sleep.com slash inside that's helix sleep.com slash inside for up to two hundred dollars off and two free pillows i mean how do you have enough energy just like with, with what you're eating that, that gives you enough energy for the day yeah, I'm weird like that i'm i've I read this thing many many years back that said you know eat to live or live to eat. And I just, I'm good. Even after I've done, like, I'm good. And the truth is, then I'll just like snack on like some nuts or like raw nuts, you know, uh, throughout. I drink a lot of liquids. And you feel (laughs) great. You feel great all day, every day. You feel great. Every day. Yeah, I feel great. You never get any kind of, I'm taking it. You never get any anxiety or anything, do you? No. You don't deal with any anxiety. No, the psilocybin helped that a lot. It did because I was thinking about, I actually am going to start microdosing on on shrooms yeah i can tell you everything about it what do you need to know i'm 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 well versed well i deal with a lot of anxiety and i want to get out of my head i want to be able to relax more i want to be able to function more than always in fight or flight mode and everything's overwhelming and i want it to stop i want those things to stop so some people have recommended that my friend jessica and she made some capsules for me and they're very very low dose and you take one every three or four days does that sound about right uh, there's two different protocols. I do my own protocol. There's a Fatiman protocol and a Stamets protocol. The Fatiman one, I believe, is uh, two days on, one day off. Uh, Stamets is five days on, two days off, mixed with some uh, different vitamins that you mix it with. Um, I do my own, um, meaning that there's different strains, right, for different things you want out of it. But really, it's all about the intention. Now, the first time I ever did 
Because I'm not counting when I was an idiot kid, right? When I was an idiot kid, and I think this is where a lot of people get tripped up. You'll do like a macro dose when you're, you know, when I used to go to limelight and I was like 15 and you do like four grams of mushrooms and you're like out of your mind, right? You're just right. like playing echo to dolphin with your friends at like four in the morning and feeling like you're in the game and you're like, <laughs> what's, what's happening here? That's not, that's not it. That's, right. that's not what it's intended for. Right. While it might be fun when you're a teenager, it's definitely not what it's intended for. So for me, as someone who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, you know, never really had a great relationship with weed. I tried, wasn't for me. To go on the microdosing journey was like frightening because I was like, wait a second. I don't know. I don't know how this is going to be. And I don't know. So I researched it for a good two years. I started listening. I read a bunch of books. Michael Pollan has a great book out. Um, I should say I listen to books. I'm not sure I read many anymore. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, right. let's stop. Let's stop trying to fool people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I listened to a bunch of stuff. I would go on these YouTube benders of like seeing it. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe, right? And then um, someone gave me some stuff that I was like, okay. And like you said before, super minimal amount. And I did a, and a minimal amount is um, anything under 0.5. So anything under 0.5 of a gram is a minimal amount for me. Right. And, and that after I did it, I took two months off uh, where I went, I need to just process what just happened because my entire earth was like off axis. I was like, what just went on? Where did my, why did I feel all these amazing things? Why was I questioning all these amazing things? Um, It was almost like the way I explained it to someone recently was, it was almost like someone woke me up. Like they tapped me on the shoulder and like, Hey, by the way, take it easy. It's okay. And I was like, what, what? And then for two months I had to process it. That was probably about I don't know. Time is irrelevant with the way the world's been the last two years, but uh, probably about two years ago. And since then, whenever I'm not filming and for no particular reason, people are like, oh, why don't you do it when you film it? I just don't. It's just one of my weird habits. When I'm not filming, I probably partake in it five of the seven days a week. And you feel like it calms you. It relaxes you. It opens your what, what are you feeling when, when it's working? It's changed your, my whole life. Changed everything. Nothing. It. It. You. I, without getting all weird, because people get so weird about that stuff. It's like it's not you, the things that you are worrying about. While they're valid, they're ultimately irrelevant. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You, like we're like we're. I've had a lot, a lot of people die and most horrifically in my life, whether it be through suicide, drug overdoses, you know, I had a lot, my birth father died when I was super young. My, my uncle who was a big part of raising me. My thing is that we're going to die. And in a hundred years from now, no one's going to really know much. Right. It, you know, it's going to happen. And we're stressing about things that the anxiety comes from a lot of these things and this pressures that we put on ourselves or that I could say I was putting on myself. And the truth is, if you look into any type of really great literature, like Albert Camus, absurdism, and you study stoicism and Marcus Aurelius and like all these different deep rabbit holes, go listen to like 17 hours of Alan Watts. You're going to understand that it's just it's kind of pointless, right? Like you can't control the world. I can't control the world. All I can do is control myself. And for me, where I'm at now with these two amazing kids, an amazing wife, an amazing uh, life that I'm trying to build upon, you know, of course there's still demons around. There's still like egos and people that are trying to, you know, make my life harder and people that are having a hard time and all that. But what am I going to do? Am I going to go to pieces about it? Am I going to go to pieces if I didn't get the job that I wanted or if it didn't? I just have to keep moving. And what it taught me when you say, what did it make me feel? It just made me kind of make it all more granular where I was like, this is silly. And life is absurd. And I just, I there's nothing I can do about it. The only thing I can do is take care of myself 
and may, meaning like I can only be the best version of myself for you. I can only be the best version of myself right now for you, for my kids, for my, for Juno, my dog next to me. And I can only worry about that. I can't control the rest of it. Wow. That really, that's what happened by doing this. This is what opened your eyes. Changed everything. Changed everything. Because look, this is obviously, you said it. This is not for everyone. Some people might go, oh, come on, you mushroom, mush. It, the, yeah. There's a science now. There's, there's, this is something that people are really talking about in the world and microdosing and helping mm-hmm. people with anxieties. And, you know, there's, there's, there's the meds that you can take. There's the microdosing. There's, you know, there's many different ways to help with things. And I think it's just a process of elimination or seeing what works for you. You know, um, hundred percent. Do the research. Watch the watch the documentaries on Netflix. There's a couple of great ones, right? Yep, um, yep. Uh, fantastic fungi, and 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 watch them, and then make your own assessment. But if you, it, I'm, I think we're in a weird part of like. I guess this is something that I've never done, and I just don't do. I don't give opinions on anything because opinions create adversaries. I always say all I can talk about is knowledge for me. And whether you agree with that, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> it has nothing to do with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just give you my knowledge for me. If you say, well, that's not true, I'll go, yeah, okay, it's true for me. So what, what does it matter what I, like you think? But we have come to this weird place where everybody feels like their thing is the right thing. So that's why when people ask me, I go, no, 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 let me just tell you what I do and what works for me. Someone might hear you eat the same thing every day and go, that's not enough nutrients. That's not enough this. And I go, okay, it works, it works for me, right? Like it's I'm so okay. I'm still, like I don't, again, I've never been one to seek out. Like I like to listen to people and I like to hear their thoughts. And then, but like I had to, as I get older and you and I know this, it's like I started shedding away the things that don't work for me and the things that work for me. So right now you're saying you have anxiety that you'd like to get past. Okay. What avenues are you going to try to do that? You can't just go one way. You got to try a multitude. Oh, I'm trying a lot of different things. You're right. You're right. I'm trying hypnotism. I'm about to start. I'm trying energy therapy. I'm trying uh, microdosing. I'm trying meds. I'm trying just trying to do, do everything that I can to live the best life I can. And then you're going to find the one and it's going to be the thing for you. And then someone's going to go, what the fuck would you do that? Try this you... instead. Try yeah, this. Try this. Yeah. Go jump out of a plane wearing a fucking furry costume and you're going to like be way better. <laughs> and you go, what? I know this works for me. And yeah. that's everybody has their thing and they think they want people to come and believe in it. So it reassures that their thing is the right thing. And this is why what I say, I don't know. People go, oh, you're a vegan. I go, sure, right now, maybe not tomorrow. I don't I don't know. Right. And I think that when you start, we want to box people so bad on things, on everything. And I'm just like, I always say this and it gets people weird. I'm like, I don't even exist. Like I exist as in when I'm a dad, I'm with my kids. When I'm with my dog, I'm Theo with the dog. I'm Theo as the dad. I'm Theo talking to you on this amazing podcast. I'm it, I'm Theo when I see you at Comic Con. Like I'm that, per- but I'm never. Who am I? I'm I'm just someone playing the role that I'm in. So I don't fucking have. I'm not. I'm not. My feet aren't in concrete on anything except one thing. Just don't be an asshole. <laughs> Simply, don't be Simply. an asshole. It's, don't be a fucking asshole. it's so much Idiot. work. It's so much more work to be an asshole, isn't it? And there's so many of them. Have you worked with a lot of assholes? Fuck yes. And it's not their fault. It's the it's the it's the system we that was built upon what we've what we've created. What and I say we, not that I was Max Sennett or Charlie Chaplin or Daryl Zanuck, but I'm saying like the the system that has been created has been. If you're talented, you can do no wrong. Mm, get away with murder. You get away with murder. If you if you sell box office, who gives a fuck? Yeah. Do what you want. And they that has gone on. And then what happens is we give awards to actors when the actor is, is silent if there's no words from a writer. 
if there's no directions from a director, if there's no lighting from a gaffer and there's no camera turned on. So it's like, how about just give an award for the entire project? Right. Because once you start singling out who's more important, that starts bleeding into the work environment. Yeah. And it's completely ludicrous when you think about it, because if an actor was the most important, he can go stand alone on a stage with nothing happening. (laughs) I like how your mind works. I'm definitely microdosing. (laughs) You know, we got deep a little bit. We started talking about microdosing and everything. There's a lot to talk about. And, uh, you know, you've got Sons of Anarchy and, you know, you were in Luke Cage and you've done tons of yeah. movies and tons of guest stars and you've been busting your ass and working. But I, by the way, I want to mention it. This new movie you have. Yeah. Emily, the criminal. I watched it. Now, listen, when they t- when your publicist was like, here's the link. You want to watch the movie? I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't have time to watch a whole fucking movie right yeah. now. What the fuck? And I just started it. I played it while I was looking at some emails. I'm being honest with you. Please. And I was sucked the fuck in. <laughs> I was sucked in. It's so intense. And it's Aubrey so Plaza is brilliant and you're brilliant in it. And it's such a, just a, this crazy relationship that happens between the two of you. And the movie is just like, you feel for, I like movies when you feel for the lead character who's doing the wrong thing, but you understand why she's doing it. And it's just this weird journey that I was honestly at times like in the room, I won't say give anything away with the clock ticking yeah. at you know, the beginning. I'm just like, Oh my God. And those characters, you're just like, it's kind of, it's a heist movie. It's, it's, it's much more than that, but I was really impressed with this and people could watch Emily, the criminal it's, where everywhere or is it everywhere? It's in theaters everywhere. Yeah. Aubrey and I uh, were just together. We did our two premieres in LA and New York. We were both kind of, flying from other jobs in and we got to see it on the big screen because we debuted at Sundance, but Sundance went virtual uh, last year and really cool. We were the highest rated film out of Sundance. You know, it was this little movie that, you know, I mean, we shot in 21 days that we just didn't, not that we didn't expect anything. Aubrey produced it. It was kind of this thing that I was doing this other movie in Atlanta and her and I zoomed and it was like, yeah, like I, when, when I see, because I produced some stuff like when I see someone putting it all out there and I read the script, it's a 90 minute movie, you know, it's a fast read yeah. on the script. And I like movies that I call like replacement theory, like where I can watch it and go, what would I do if I was that person? What would I do if I was in that situation? Those are my favorite movies. It's like the game with Michael Douglas. Like, oh what would yeah. I do? yeah. Yeah. You know, what would happen here? And it's when I watch films and I read films like that, I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to go on that ride. It's like a six flags ride. And her and I just, you know, when it debuted at Sundance, it had a ton of buzz, you know, like I said, highest rated one, we were just waiting for it to come out. Roadside's amazing. Um, We're in like, I think we're in like 500 theaters now across the country, which is really cool. Um, It did really well. It's the highest critical thing I've ever been a part of Um, in all ways. She's extraordinary in it. Yeah, and, extraordinary. Um, Both you guys. It's yeah, and you just want people, you know, John Patton Ford, first time director. Um great job. Just, yeah, just amazing. So it's been a really cool like run the last few years. And I feel like this was the one that I was I'm really excited about this one because it's again a wildly different character than I've been playing. Yeah, you well, guys have to see it. Emily the criminal. I mean, it really is good. Trust me. I was if you, you could write into me, you could write on the Patreon yeah. and you could tell me what an asshole I am, but you're, yeah. I'm not wrong on this one. This was a movie that I was just emailing while I'm listening and watching. And then I just got sucked in. I'm telling you. And there was no turning back. It was just great performances, intensity, uh, just a really good story. And you care about the characters, which is, which is hard to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's that anti-hero thing we've been doing since like, you know, uh, uh, Vic Mackey and the shield and, you know, obviously a, a bunch of things where you start to like the villain. I think we've probably been doing it a lot longer than that. It's just been, you know, kind of more, uh, uh, amplified with television. Yeah. Right. You know, speaking of, we were just talking about this the other day, my buddy and I, it's like, and you, you know, you obviously taking on one of the most legendary characters in history and Lex Luthor, but I talk about Gene Hackman and when he played Lex Luthor, it's like, I liked him way more than Superman when I was a kid. I knew I did. I I don't know why I just did like him better. (laughs) He was better to watch. Yeah. Right. That's not supposed to happen. But then if you look at the Godfather and stuff like that, we identify more where we go, oh, 
because they're, you know, they're, uh, I'm probably going to say the word wrong, but they're, they're fallible. Yeah. They're where with with superheroes or good characters, I don't mean in the literal sense of the cape, when you're the good character, the, the straight, you know, lace, you can't have anything wrong with you where the, the one who's a little, uh, ambiguous has more things going on there's and that's life we're all you know the yin and the yang of life so so i think that with emily that's the service of what john created where you go i know these people are doing something wrong but i gotta tell you i kind of like them i know it's just so weird when that happens it's it's a little magic because usually you know the films a lot of the movies i watch i just feel like you know if you don't start out with them in a movie at least liking someone or someone is engaging or there's you just it doesn't matter how good the movie is in terms of like you know story and whatever you've got to somehow connect with these characters if you're going to go on this journey i feel anyway a lot of times yeah, and, and, no, that, and that, it doesn't happen do you ever find let me ask you a question because you've met a ton of people in this business do you ever find that like if you don't like someone you can't watch them anymore uh yeah I'm not going to make any say any names, but there's some people I'm like, I just can't look at that person. I can't you don't look believe at that person. I can't hear that person. I know. And it's probably shallow of me, but it's just, it's, it's a gut reaction. It's a gut reaction. It's a gut reaction. Don't you ever meet somebody in person in real life? And then just go, I just, I don't like that person. Or I, yeah. I would never hang out with that person. That's the same thing. I, I equate it to like the animals that I'm around all the time. And like, especially my dog, like she just either likes you or she doesn't, right? She <laughs> just knows. She just knows. Like, she'll be like, wait a second. Or she just goes bananas and right. like throws it at you. And like, she's on you. Right. I feel that way around certain people. I'm like, and you can call it energy. You can call it whatever you want, but you go, uh, not for me. Yeah. And then it's on the flip where if I meet someone and they're like amazing, I can't wait to watch their stuff. I'm like, yeah. oh man, I'm going to watch everything that person's in because they were such a great person. And that's the weird thing about this business because you meet some people in stuff that you used to like and you're like, oh, I can't watch that anymore. I know. It's, yeah, I know. It's a shame. It's a shame. Sometimes you meet people and they're just not what you thought and you're like, oh my God. And then, yeah, you can't go back and watch them. Man, we don't have to get into the names, but no. I really want to. But you know, look, um, awesome on the movie emily the criminal you guys got to see it please check it out it's really freaking good but you know we were talking about all these good things how you have your shit together how you have this routine you get your family and you love your family and you get dog and you got this ranch and it seems like life's going great for you knock on wood i always knock on wood where's, i don't know wood? if that works where's wood well it works for me see it works for me we were just talking about that theo okay hold on there you go we're in yeah Thank you. Um, but it wasn't always rainbows for you. No. I mean, you grew, you grew up with a single mom. Your dad wasn't around. What? What? Explain that story, like, growing up. Super weird, I guess, in the 80s of – I was the first person that I knew that their father wasn't living in the house. Like, he was gone. And, like, everyone was aware of it. And, again, this is probably around 19 – I mean, totally aging ourselves here. Let's see. I was nine. So, 81, so 84, 84. 84. 84. And I remember thinking like, huh. But I was, you know, and again, they tried to like pull the, you know, oh, he's just moving closer to work. I was like, he works like a mile and a half away. Like, was he, was he going to move closer for? It takes five minutes to get there. But I was more rational where my sister was like, oh, that makes sense. That was yeah, it. He'll get there in a minute. And I was like, okay. But I knew, you know, you always knew. Here's the thing. Everybody goes through it. He was he was a person. And I could say this now that, you know, I found out he died on the Internet in 2010. And I only found that out because I went out and searched looking for him after the success of Sons of Anarchy. Um because I'd been written up in the local paper in New York. And I was like, maybe the time is now, because the last time we had a conversation was um when my uncle, his brother had killed himself and I had to call and tell him because he didn't know. Oof. And I hadn't talked to him in years and the conversation did not go well. And here's the thing. He was a guy who was not supposed to be a father. There's a very big difference. 
right? This is why I always tell people if you're contemplating having kids, once you have children, it's them. Your whole existence is into them. It doesn't mean that your life stops. It means your life changes. And if you still are embarking on an ego journey and it's all about you, well, you're doomed because now you're going to become resentful. You're going to start acting out of character. You're going to do things. Now, this is back in the time when they didn't have the resources, the tools to talk like we are now, to have conversations. It just was, well, I don't want to do that. I'm doing, I'm doing this. I didn't fulfill these things I wanted to do. He had gotten around some, you know, unsavory characters. He was an unsavory character himself, and he just wasn't meant to be a father. My mom was super young, and uh, he was gone, and that was it. And what that did for me, now that I can look back on it, while it was hectic, it brought every thing in my life because it gave me like a bit of a chip on my shoulder, and it kind of made me it put me in scenarios of like working and different thoughts and like what I, that I needed to succeed and I needed to do something different. I want to turn out like him. And there were times where I was going to be like him. And there were all these different things that I had learned from that lesson. So as I grow older, I look back on it and it was tumultuous. I mean, I remember at a young age, um, there are a lot of weird things that happen now that I look back on. I talk about it with my mom sometimes. I mean, there was a time where the FBI came and raided my house and they were looking for my dead grandmother because everything was put in her name. Um, there was all these strange occurrences of like, you know, waiting, sitting on the stoop where he's supposed to come and get you for the weekend and he never shows, right? And it's like, it's like out of a movie. Right? I was just going to say like, that. That's like, wow. It's like out of a movie that where happened. they don't show. And then when they do show, there were times when they did show when he was hammered. And like, you know, you're in this car and you're like, I'm going to fucking die on this thing. And all of that stuff starts to play into who you become. And you're going to go one way or the other. And I've definitely gone all the ways, you know, as as the as the macho man Randy Savage once famously said, I've soared with the eagles and I've slithered with the snakes and everything in between, right? Yeah. But you got to keep moving forward. It's like all those things leave impressions on your brain and you start to grow up really fast. So I started doing things at a super young age that I'm happy now because they made me who I am. But as having two young kids, I'm like, Oof, that was too young. That was too young to do those things, I think. But again, I don't know, right? It just, I know life is what it is. So I was around, I was all women, right? My, my sister, my mom, my Nana, you know, I was around all women and it was amazing. It's an incredible way to be raised because I was able to have the toughness of where I grew up and have the, 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 I should say the, the, the smarts the fragility, the smarts, and the and and the the intestinal fortitude and tenacity of the women who were around me, and I think that that prepared me for life. And I think that I my mom was an artist; she's a dressmaker. My birth father, before he even though he led a extremely criminal lifestyle, was a really wonderful artist, um, a great designer. was was very smart, but again. Never, almost like Yusuf in Emily the Criminal, never, he wanted more, but he was thrust into this life. Right. Um, And that was just the beginnings. But then I went through, you know, I did all the typical, you know, hectic stuff of figuring out who I was. I just got really fortunate that I figured it out uh, before I was too old. Did you get pretty deep into things? Because I know you came out with openly to say that you were dealing drugs and things like that. Were there times yeah. where you could have died many times? I've been in some really precarious situations. Let me fix this camera. I was in some precarious situations, meaning that I didn't know any better. I was I was not equipped for I was not okay. So if you're if you're from a family of lawyers, you kind of yeah, we're gonna you're gonna be a lawyer, or you know, military families, a lot of guys follow or women follow in the footsteps of their father and join, you know, and go downrange and join. So you're kind of raised by the thing around you. So when there's no one there, 
when the goal is survival, you figure it out. And for me, when it came to, you know, hustling and dealing drugs and doing whatever I was doing, it was just because it was the only thing I knew how to do. I always say that no criminal wants to do crime. They just do it because they don't really fucking know what else to do, right? No one's giving them another uh, avenue. And f- and then you go, well, you can go work here. I remember that. I remember when I went to go try and work at Blockbuster my freshman year in college. And they were like, okay, so you have to wear tan pants. Go get those. I was like, I don't have any money to get tan fucking pants. And then they were like, okay, and you're going to get, I think back then it was like $275 an hour. And I was like, $275 an hour? I could flip an ounce and make $600. Why would I do that? It sounds ridiculous. Because, again, I just always thought of life in time. So this scenario was never like, oh, yeah, but you're not going to go to jail for fucking putting away Fast Times in Richmond High the wrong way. I wasn't thinking <laughs> that when I was doing it. Right. It, was, it was just, it was just, I can do this and that seemed more reasonable. Yeah. And there was no one there going, it's not reasonable. Let me tell you why. Mm. It was just me and my own brain and the people who were around me who had the same mindset as me who were going, yeah, fuck it. Let's just. Let's just flip some, let's go grab 20 pounds and do this. And you go, oh, cool. Cause it made more sense. So again, I think it's what your, your, what's in your toolkit. What do you have for you? And I didn't have, I had different set of skills <laughs> as they would say. I didn't have the right set of skills, maybe I guess in societal terms, but I learned them. Yeah. I learned them on my own. What got you out of it though? What 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 happened that life took a different direction? Because a lot of times you get you go down that path, and that's a lot of times people can't get can't come back from that. There's always a moment. Everything's a moment. There's always a moment. Like when I stopped even drinking and doing anything, there's always a moment. There's a moment that something happens. Someone says something that you go, oh. And for me, when that happened, I had been in a situation where I basically got brought in by the cops for something. And when I, and I got let go for a reason, might've known a few people. And when I got home to keep this story as shallow as possible, when I got home, I realized that I could have been in a lot more trouble for what I might have had on me. That wasn't found. And I realized, like when I jumped out of a plane once, that I'll never do it again. You can only spit in God's face so many times, right? So it's like I knew at that moment I had to make a decision that I was like, okay, I'm okay. I'm here. If I do this again, I might not be. So what's what's the choice? What am I going to do? Am I going to go again? And roll the dice, or am I going to stop and figure out something else? Most people can't make that decision. Or can't stop. You think that that's hard, it's a hard decision to make. That you were, you had enough foresight or, or whatever that you you sort of just understood in a mature way, weirdly mature that I'm gonna. This is not going to end well. It was. It was the first time I'd ever really looked at the ramifications of it. Right. It it didn't mean that it fully stopped then either. It means that at that moment, that was a stop to the next part. Right. And it was like every, and then even when I got to LA, I only knew certain skills. Right. So like I only knew certain things. I didn't have skills beyond labor. Right. Like I just, and, and, and I considered that, you know, hustling like labor. I just only knew I was either going to go work a construction site or bartend or bar back or deal drugs. Like that, that was it. I did. That was the extent of my resume in life. Like I just didn't, if you told me, Oh, we're going to go, you know, lay rugs in a building. Like I used to do on the summers. Sure. I can do that. But I only had a limited, I, I didn't have many skills. So when I looked at that one skill at that time, I went, I can't do this. I got to figure something else out. So I figured something else out. At that moment, but then sometimes you have to revert back to the only skills you know have you, you know have. I remember in two thousand. Oh God, you were probably in LA in two thousand and yep. two, three, two thousand three, two thousand two. I was working in a restaurant in a bar. I had booked a co-star recurring. I didn't know the difference. I thought once I got a recurring on the show Boston Public, 
that I was going to be, this is it. See you later. Rob Lowe, here I come. I'm coming for the cover of People Magazine. Like, this is it. <laughs> and then and then uh, that ended after three episodes. And I was like, wait, I just quit my job. Like, I was like, wait, I thought this was it. Again, I didn't have the skill set. So I had to figure it out. How was I going to keep pursuing what I wanted to do? Because this was a time when back in the day, you used to have six auditions a day. You'd have commercials. You'd have guest stars. You'd be learning stuff in the car. And I had to figure it out. And my buddies at the time had opened up uh, an after hours. And it was in Liberace's old penthouse wow. on Beverly Boulevard. And it opened at 11, uh, 2 in the morning. And it closed at like 11 in the next day. Oh my God. And I was the only bartender in there. And uh, I saw some shit in that place. What'd you say? Can't talk about it. It was wild. It was wild. I want you to imagine this. It was only like word of mouth. And it was in Liberace's old penthouse. And it was all famous people. Doing. And I was the only bartender and there were like two waiters. So you saw snorting and drugs and sex and boobs everywhere and dongs the wildest shit i've ever fucking like i would literally go to my friends and go did you fucking see who's in that room did you see what's going on over there did you see this did you see what's happening by the pool like it was insane as a young kid who was so enamored by hollywood <laughs> it was it was like someone brought you behind the wizard curtain and I was like, what the fuck is this? Big actors. You're talking big A-list actors. I'm talking like Oscar winners. I'm talking like, I'm talking like the biggest of the big from music to acting to everything. And I was like, holy shit, this is the craziest shit I've ever seen. This is like, I, I don't understand how and and all through the night, right? Two days Jesus. in a row. Jesus. And how much are you yeah. making? Are you how much are you making in a night like tons, this? Tons, tons of money. Because I was, I was so, I had such a like a hustle attitude. When my thing was, if you now remember, most people are geeked out of their face. If they want to get a drink from me, they have to give me a lot of money because I'm the only one working. So they're peeling off like hundreds just because the alcohol is free. Which they used to, you know, do that shit where they'd fill up the Grey Goose bottles with like the, you know, the the uh, whatever pop off, like the shittiest vodka right, on the planet. Right, right. Yeah, and then and then you, they would say, "Oh, I want I want the Grey Goose. Here's three hundred. And you're like, "Okay, sure, <laughs> sure, it's Grey Goose. Let me just put a lot of soda in it." And they would give. So I would make. Uh, I was making a couple of thousand for two days. Wow. At least, yeah. That's insane. And it, and then I'd have my whole week off for auditioning. That's beautiful. <laughs> what a it's treat. Amazing. What a damn treat. You know, that lasted like two years. Um, I look at your like resume and like you did so many guest stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, Law and Order, Hawaii 5 0, The Unit, Jericho Bones, Without a Trace, Veronica Mars, NYPD Blue, CSI. I mean, it goes on and on. House Lost. Of the Don't forget Lost. That was my favorite. Lost. One. I love Lost. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, you were in everything. I mean, was it. So this is what you. I guess this is like during the 2000s? Early 2000s. And so what yeah. was the the big break? Was was the big break? Sons, Sons of Anarchy? That was the big yeah. first. I'm a regular on a show. Yeah, I did. I did two pilots that never got picked up. One was a sitcom, and one was uh, one was I guess like kind of like a Grey's Anatomy ripoff. They didn't go, and I was Mister Guest Star. There was a there was a time where I was doing a movie in New Orleans, and there were three guest stars airing at the same day, three different networks that I had done on like a Wednesday at eight p.m. And my mom was like, "Which one do I watch?" I was like, "I don't know." <laughs> CBS, ABC, NBC. I was on all three. And it was one of these weird things where I was doing a lot of guest stars and a lot of commercials. And when Sons came, Sons is a strange story. I auditioned for every single role in Sons. Like when I say every role, I started with Jax. I went down the, the line and I didn't get anything. And Wendy uh, O'Brien, who is the cast director, had just cast, uh, cast me in two things. 
One was a, a show medical investigation with Neil McDonough that I did like a guest spot on and she loved. And one was this Chris Carter movie that never came out called Bellflower. Um, Chris Carter, creator of the X-Files. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She she was championing for me on Sons, but I didn't get it. And I was like, and it was a weird time in my life because my uncle, who was the, the single most biggest influence on me uh, to this day, he moved to North uh, Northern California when he was 21, when his when my grandfather died. He left New York. And he became like a bit of like a biker. He was a rockabilly biker. And then he worked at San Quentin. And then he got caught dealing drugs. And he went into San Quentin as a prison. Like it was like this whole crazy story. And he was the most colorful human being I'd ever met in my life. And he would sit there while we would go for walks when I was in New York. And he would just talk to me about these motorcycle clubs. And he would give me like the history of it. And he, this is years before. So I was under the impression that Sons was like my destiny because he died in 04 when I was doing this movie in uh, Toronto. I'd found out he died at the rap party. So I was like, oh, did, I'm supposed to do this show. But I didn't get it. And then about a week later, I got a call from Wendy O'Brien. She said, hey, uh, Kurt, the creator, wants to talk with you. And I was like, Okay. She's like, just, just talk to him. He, he has an idea for something. I was like, okay. And he's really short with the way he talks. And he goes, uh, I, listen, I don't know if you'll be in one episode or a hundred. I don't know if you'll have one line or a hundred. I, I don't know. I just want you on the show. And I was like, okay. He's like, but we don't have any money. And like, it, like, but I just want you on the show. And I was like, okay. So I went back and I was testing for another pilot at the time. And I told my, uh, manager at the time, um, they left me after this. Um, I said, I'm going to do that show. And they're like, no, you're not. It's like zero dollars. You're testing. I said, no, 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 I'm going to do that show. And I did. And uh, I got made a regular in the second season. And uh, my entire life changed. I met my wife through it. My whole life and my whole existence. You met your wife on set? No. When I went over to Iraq and Kuwait, uh, Baghdad, like we did all the USO tours. Right. My wife... Uh, she was a former news anchor and she was um, doing PR for military charities. She started with Marcus Luttrell and them. And then she was doing stuff for the boot campaign. And we met through that. And um, a couple of years later, we kind of met, you know, again, and now we have two kids and we live on a ranch in Texas. So again, it all came from like everything else, like all my other jobs came from sons and came from that moment of right. like Wendy taking a chance and Kurt taking a chance and me taking a chance. Yeah. How would you sum it up? Like if you had to sum up Sons of Anarchy for all those years you did it. I mean, it was probably grueling schedule and a lot of work, right? Absolute chaos, but I have it no other way. It was like Charlie and I just said when we did that Reaper review thing with Kim and I, it was like going to college. Like for me, I had been around, I was around these, for me, again, I'm like a, I love character actors. I, it's weird because I would think all actors are characters, but whatever. I love character actors. And I think it's like when I saw Ron Perlman and Kim Coates and Tommy Flanagan and Katie Seagal and like, and, and I did the original pilot with Scott Glenn, like who I had done, who I had done a movie with prior to that. I was enthralled. I was also a giant fan of the shield. So I was like, so happy to be there. Um, chaos. It was absolute chaos. I, when I did Luke Cage right after it, I had the same executive producer writer who was on that show with me. And it was uh, also the showrunner had done this movie. I did low riders. He wrote that. I was almost like, um, I rescue all my dogs. And so I know what it's like. I was like a dog who just got rescued, but they were like, Hey, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. They just need you on set. Like, it's okay. Cause it was like, I was so tense all the time from sons all the time. Really just tense with wanting to be great, wanting it to work. What, what was it? It was like a heavy show. Like it was yeah. heavy in all aspects. It was, I, I could talk about the positives for days. Like, I don't know what it's like to be in the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or being like a rock band, like even a, a, a minimal one. But like when we were together and we were together all the time on our bikes, going to comic cons, going to restaurants, going to bars, it was like being rock stars. Like you would just roll up 11 deep 
and everyone was in the show and people were like, what the fuck is happening here? So it was that where it was like, I'd never been exposed to that. I was a guest star actor. And then at the same time, it was the schedule of the amount of we were filming on the budget we were filming. It would be compared to like a low budget indie now. And we were filming at a at an accelerated pace. And then the emotions were running so high. So we would, we had no other choices but to, well, I know for me, and maybe it's because I'm not nearly as good as an actor as all the other people, I had no other choice but to exist as that character all the time because of the schedule. Wow. So, and Juice was like a really fucked up character. So I was kind of fucked up for like eight years. Really? It messed you up for eight years. You were just kind of like not quite yourself. I tried to turn it off, but it was like, we were always all together. So our dynamic was shaped from the show. Wow. So it was like, you were, you were emulsified into who you were. So it was like, you, you, you almost had to take it on because it was so all the time, all the time. You were always reminded like all the time, right? You have a, especially when you have a mohawk and tattoos on your head, like you can't, you're that guy, right? <laughs> you can't right? get away from it. You can't get away from it, which is an amazing thing. And it really, I think, like Charlie and I said the other day, I don't think you can ever do that again. It was like a, it was like a moment in time right. that doesn't exist anymore. It's like the Sopranos. I talked to those guys and they had a lot of the same exact kind of deal where they were just together all the time. They go to dinners all the time and their characters kind of acted like their characters. Do you still talk to all the guys? All of them. All the time. All the time. Just wow, what a brotherhood. That's crazy. I just got off with Kim. I just got off with Coates. Uh, I was texting with Perlman. I love them. I love, I, I, it, it was like, um, it's like we went, now we can reflect on it like now, but it was like, we went through this thing that we were all unsure of at the end and we just needed to get away from each other. And then we came back around. I think that happens. I think that happened even with me and my co-star Tom. Uh, yeah, we, we, we were, we were, you know, we were really cool, but the last thing you want to do is hang with people that you're on set with all day for, for all those years. And then yeah. a couple years passed and then it just sort of a friendship evolved, you know, and a respect. And a respect. A mutual respect. It was really weird. And like we we do things together. We, you know, it's it's nice. Um, this is called shit talking with Theo Rossi. Uh, this is my top tier patrons. They ask questions, you answer rapidly if you'd like. If for some reason you want to oh, talk about it, you can't but my you brain's can working. This Let's is, go. I, go to patreon.com slash inside of you. I appreciate all the love. I'll send you a message if you join it. Thanks for the support of the show. Here we go. Sophie M, what is something you wish you knew now that you didn't know when you started acting? Uh it- don't give a fuck what anyone says. Mm, God, I wish I could live by that. Dana S., what is in your music playlist besides I uh, the Tiger? <laughs> besides, <laughs> uh, my music taste is all over the place. Um, usually it's uh, mellow folk music at this point. Um, that's what I hit on the uh, Amazon. But I've become rapidly obsessed with this elvis movie and the soundtrack that mm-hmm. bass put out i love elvis that movie was good i like the movie he was extraordinary he was extraordinary extraordinary baz baz's mind is extraordinary the soundtrack if you get the one that he did he explains the songs and it's in a certain order and it's curated the right way is extraordinary um but I listen to, 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 to answer more specific, I've been listening to a lot of John Prine lately. I haven't listened to enough of him. It's really good. All right. Uh, Danny, what attracted Theo? Well, what attracted you to Emily, the criminal fantastic chemistry with Aubrey Plaza? Well, Aubrey. you told him, you, you pretty much told us. Yeah. I had never seen her in anything. I tell her this all the time. I had not seen her. The, the only uh, film that I had watched her work in without even knowing it was this Christmas film that I think was on Netflix. But I had not watched Parks and Recs. I had not seen Black Bear. I'd seen them all now. Um, I had not seen Inger Goes West. And it's just for the lack of like the last seven years with kids has just right. been, you know, I watch 
you know, wreck it Ralph every five minutes. So it's like, I don't, you know what I mean? Ask me about Coco. I'll tell you everything, but I just didn't know about the other stuff. So, but when I got on the zoom with her and John, that she was easily the reason. Really? She's Yeah. She's a legend. She's, I I tell her she's uh, I've never seen it. So, you know, we're in such a weird time, right? 650 television shows, 950 movies last year. We don't like what she's doing is extraordinary. She's hysterical. Yet. I can just name three movies. That is some of the best dramatic performances I've ever seen. Emily being the best of them, maybe black bear. That's such a rarity. I can only name very few actors. Phil Hoffman comes to mind and Robin Williams and people that do drama and comedy seamlessly, you know, and she is doing that. There's just a very few. And I know, of course, everybody's going to be like, yeah, but not at that level. Of course, give her a moment. Yeah. She just, you know, but it's like when you're doing that seamlessly, when you're funny and you're knocking it out of park dramatically, I mean, we got to stop and pause for a second and say, that's a rarity. Yeah. There are certain actors that I absolutely, I love Daniel Day Lewis, but hasn't made me laugh recently. You know what I mean? <laughs> hasn't made you laugh ever. Well, no, I actually did find him pretty funny as Bill the Butcher. He's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> what was that called in New York? Uh, Gangs of New Five York. Points. Gangs of New York. Gangs of New York. Uh, you know, Megan T says, what type of character do you love to play? And on the other hand, which one do you hate to be type as? In other words, I would say, what do you want to do? What would you like to do? What kind of role? I just want to, at this point, I just want to work with good people. Like I, like to me, like the character I'll create, whatever's in there, I'll make it something, whatever. Cause you could always find something in a character. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. obviously you want great writing, but you can find something at this point because I'm so aware of how short life is. I just want to work around good people. I don't want to be in those like tense, weird situations of like, fuck, I got to avoid this person. And this person shows up three hours late or fucking oh, this is happening. Like, it's like, I just don't have time for that shit. Like I'm, I'm, I'm to, you know, to quote Brian Cox recently, like, you know, the great Brian Cox, he said, uh, uh, I'm too old. I'm too tired, and I'm too talented. Fuck off! Like I just don't have, <laughs> I just don't have the time. So it's like I just want to work with really great people. Character wise, um, you know, uh, you can make anything three dimensional. You can make, you know, that's why when people say, "Oh, did you play a lot of bad guys?" I'm like, "Bad to who? To the viewer? Not to me. I don't think they're bad guys. Right? You know, right. It, you know. Or if you say, "Don't you want to play like good guys?" Or that? Sure, whatever. I love it. You've got such a good attitude. Damn you, Theo. I need to listen to Theo in the morning. I need him to make a recording for me that I could listen to every morning and before I go to bed. Give me some confidence. Give me some perspective on life. Hey, you know, I'm going to ask you, and I hate to end on a downer, but I, I keep thinking about it, that that when you when you were looking up your father, yeah, uh, you know, because you had all the success, and then when you found yeah. out he had passed... What kind of emotions happen? I mean, have you have you learned to forgive him? Have you have is that yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It's not a downer either at all. I mean, um, when it I'll never forget, it was 2010. It was my last year of smoking cigarettes. I was smoking an American spirit on this porch on Los Telos, the top of outpost. I had this really cool, I called it the Batman house. And it was like overlooking all of Hollywood and I couldn't sleep. And I went on the computer and my, my cousin who was a cop in New York, I had written him and said, how do I find this dude? Like, what do I do? And he's like, Oh man, it's all public records. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, just go on this, you know, pay $40 or whatever it is. You get everything you need to know. I was like, Oh, cool. Because his number is not working. He was out of service or whatever. And um, I'll never forget. I was sitting on that porch I had three dogs at the time. They were all with me and I was smoking American spirit and I was scrolling on the computer and I had paid for whatever it was. I don't even know if it still exists, publicrecords.com or whatever it was. And I was scrolling through and it showed all the addresses and the arrests and this. And I was like, oh yeah, it's definitely him. Right. And I got to the bottom and it said, uh, died September 29, 2009. And I was like, Oh fuck. What? No. 
and I refreshed and I was like, wait a second, maybe I got the wrong one. But then it was his birthday. It was everything was right. So for a minute, I kind of like. It's, you know, it's a gut punch in the beginning, but then it was like, oh, fuck. Okay. Okay. And it was a test for me because I had just gotten my life to a certain place where I was either going to go that way or I was going to go back that way. And this was one of those things I said, which way are you going to go now? Where are you going to go? And I was like, okay. And here's what I'll say about the whole situation. Not just have I, I've never had to forgive him. I don't need to forgive anyone. I don't need to forgive anyone. And I, I do, it's not part of my thing. People do what they do. I'm closer to him now than I ever was. However, that is relatable to other people. It might not be. It might be. It only matters for me. I speak to him, see him, talk to him, and have a way better relationship than I did in the however many years we didn't talk. However many, the little things that I remember from when I was young. But now in the research, in the going back, I got it all. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. Yeah, th uh, this has been eye-opening. <laughs> I really love your your attitude. I mean, you've been around the block. You've kind of been, you've experienced all these different emotions and 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 what life throws at you. And you you've ended up in such a positive, great place. And I couldn't be happier for you. It's uh, oh, it's tremendous, lot, man. man. It, it's tremendous, dude. It, it really is. And uh, this, well, what you're doing is tremendous. I, I I really do. I appreciate so much what you're doing. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, what I love about everything that's happening, and more importantly, what you're doing is like conversation is the key to all, right? Like at the end of the day, being able to just speak and talk, the one thing that it shows everyone is how similar we all are. Exactly. If we just let people speak. We start to realize how similar we all are. But when it's happening in 140 characters, faceless, no, you know, whatever, that's when it shows more differences. And I think that conversations like this, even if you relate to one, two, three things, it just shows that we're all part of this thing. And more importantly, like it's all going to be over in a fucking blink. So what you're doing it's just cool. Like, you know, whatever, whatever everybody wants to think, it's just really cool. So I appreciate it uh, more than you know. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, I'm going to ask your publicist for your email because I have to, yeah. every once Let's in a while, it. just check. Whenever you want to talk, whatever you need to know, I am I will give you whatever ridiculous knowledge. Remember, I'm south side of an idiot on most things, but some things I have some knowledge. I love it. Hey, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for allowing me to be inside of you. Uh, you yeah. were so much better than Terrible. Kim and, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm kidding. You guys were great. Full you, guys, circle. you guys were all great. Um, this has been awesome, dude. Have a great day. And thanks for, yeah. uh, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you really enjoy your day. All right, buddy. What can you say? Um, I want to hang out with that guy. I think I, I I've actually texted him since the interview just to say, Hey, what's up, man? Just thinking, you know, and he, he responded just loved loved him and uh how open he was i was so surprised you never know when you don't know someone and you interview them ryan hmm. you're like how deep are they going to get how open are they going to be are they going to be talkative are they going to be or are they going to be a dud mm -hmm. and he was more than anticipated let's just say that so uh thanks for supporting the podcast guys thanks for everything thanks for joining patreon if you're a patron patreon.com slash uh inside of you i want to say talkville because we have one there too but uh patron really helps the podcast so much we wouldn't do this without the top tier without all the patrons who give back to the show i don't care if it's a dollar or whatever it's like something that you know helps pay for shit and uh thank you for listening hopefully um you'll listen uh continue to listen here are the shout outs for our wonderful patrons top tier patrons get a shout out here they are Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jilly, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Sophie M, Kristen K, 
Raj C, Joshua D, CJP, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Kimberly E, Mike E, Eldon Supremo, 99 More, Ramira, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N. Correct. I knew it. Um, this is a random. Chris H, Dave H, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Liliana A, Talia C. No. M. Okay. Betsy. D. Correct. Mm-hmm. Chad L. Marion. Dan N. Big Stevie W. Angel M. Rhiannon C. Corey K. Deb Nexon. Michelle A. Jeremy C. Andy T. Gavinator. David C. John B. Brandy D. Camille S. The Chief. Joey M. Design. OTG. Eugene and. Uh, Leah. Correct. Nikki G. Corey. Katie B. Heather L. Jake B. Megan T. Mel S. Orlando C. Uh, Caroline. I've already forgotten. R. Okay. Christine S. Sarah S. Eric H. Shane R. M. R. Jeremy V. Andrew M. Zatuichi 77. Oracle. Chris R. Michael F. Karina N. Michelle D. Amanda R. Amanda S. Jen B. Kevin E. Katie Red. And Stephanie K. I don't know what I would do without you patrons. Thank you again. And thanks for listening. Um. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get over the, the anxiety. I'm still dealing with it. I feel like it's a little better. You just have to keep trying. You have to keep trying different meds, and you have to keep, you know, exercising. I'm doing hypnotherapy. I'm mm-hmm. really trying to battle this. You kind of have to do a lot all at once. It's not just one easy fix, is it? No, it's not an easy fix. It's uh, It's the toughest thing I've gone through, I think, in a while, a long while. I think the biggest thing I've gone through, it's just like trying to get back on track. And I feel like, you know, you just got to keep working therapy, 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 exercise, and uh, be good to yourself. Mm. Most like, most importantly. Mm. Um, Thank you guys again for listening uh, from the Hollywood Hills in Hollywood, California. I am Michael Rosenbaum. I'm Brian Tayers. Brian (laughs) Tayers. We love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And always remember to be good to yourselves. I will see you very soon. Thank you.